In proof that this is a channel which often ignores what's probably sensible in order to produce videos about what I find interesting and hope other people will enjoy it, I give you Key Ship Series 7, Ship 10, or Ships 10, HMS Princess Beatrix and HMS Queen Emma. If you have never heard of them before, don't worry, many people haven't. They are landing ship infantry medium. A completely interesting designation, which mostly covers a load of converted ships in World War II. And are really quite cool. However, to say they are overlooked by history is to say that when I was researching my book on the Tribal's Battles and Darings, and I was talking about the Lofoten Raid, there were four books I looked into which discussed the Lofoten Raid, and not only did they list the formation as four destroyers, they listed as four destroyers and two landing ships. And at no point did they give a name of any of the destroyers or any of the landing ships. At all! I mean, okay, I can... I find it annoying, but I understand why people forget destroyer names. It just is so many of them, it must be truly hard to remember them all. Truly, truly hard. But there are two landing ships involved. Two! And it's... Beatrix and Emma, Princess and Queen. These are not exactly complicated names. Now, please note, most books are fairly decent and do at least include their names, even if not decent pictures of them. Although, I have read some very interesting descriptions of their conversion. I have read some very interesting descriptions of their conversion, which I find even more interesting because there is this book in the world. If I just quickly disappear this. In this book, from the transactions of the Royal Naval Institute of Naval Architect, which means the pe the chapters in here, the book, uh, the section here, are actually papers in the Institute of Royal Institute of Naval Architecture. Which means you can go and get them and read the individual papers. Which means it's incredibly easy to find the first chapter, pretty much therefore the first paper in here, and an entire section on their conversion. I mean. That's, that's such a hard amount of research for anyone to do. I realise my colleagues are very, very much overrun, and the concept of going to such an organisation as the Royal Institute of Naval Architects and asking if they have any papers about the design and construction of a type of ship would be very difficult for them, especially as if they're writing books which are supposed to specialise in amphibious ships. I realise that would be incredibly difficult for them. But I've done it. So, you know, difficult as it may be, it is doable. You can even track down them in book form. Yes. So, Princess Beatrix and Queen Emma. And they start life as Dutch fairies. And, of course, the re one of the reasons I'm interested in them was that Again, it's the similar thing that started off on the Tribal's Battles and Darings, for me. And it's the similar thing which has started the U-Class Submarine Project and the Flower Class Boat. Uh, the Flower Class Project. The amount of times I see them just, oh, there were some Flower Class Corvettes there as well. Or, the, there was a British submarine. Which British submarine? What was it? What, uh, you know, who was in command? What type of submarine? <laughs> what was it doing? Why was it there? There are all these questions I would like to ask. And people don't answer them. So, I go, uh, basically, it's, I get told off by publishers. I get told off by people who advise academics on how to make money in their careers and all these things. And they keep telling me that I am doing the wrong thing repeatedly because I'm going off and writing about things and researching things which are apparently, whilst they're interesting to me, because I feel the questions need to be answered, are not interesting to the public, so you don't need to worry about answering them. That's not what they want to hear about. They want another book about, I don't know, Bismarck. And there are some really good books out about Bismarck. Please, I have no objection to books about Bismarck. I just don't think you need another one out there at the moment. I don't think there's anything I can really add at the moment to the books that are out there. So I wouldn't do that. But Anyway. Fairies of the Netherlands Unites. Um, 
that was, of course, my shameless book plug. Trying to show the publishers that people are interested in these things. Fairies of the Netherlands Unite. HMS Princess Beatrix and HMS Queen Emma. This is how they look like in normal life. This is what they look like when they are normally operating at, well, these are post-World post, post -World War II pictures. So, this is what they normally look like. Don't look cute. They're not big ships, they're not massive ships. But they have space. They have five decks of space. They are, in effect, open spaces, able to be adapted, as relatively speaking, as far as the Navy's concerned. But pretty much the concept of construction comes after... They've had the concept for years of amphibious tra transport ships, and they've worked out various ideas from them. One of the ideas I'll be showing you in a second. Oh, a few seconds. But the actual construction of them, I'm going to literally... To show how difficult this is, I'm going to open up the paper. And I'm going to read. Now, don't worry. The illustrations which it's sort of going to talk about are going to be slides later in here. So, you'll get to see them. The conversion of the Glens, another class I'll do at some point, was only a beginning. But next type of vessel, the vessels to be used were of a completely different type. They were Dutch cross-channel ferret ships, which had become available after the invasion of the Low Countries. The two of these ships, Pinterest, Beatrix, and Queen Emma, were fitted out as Landing Ship Infantry Medium, or LSIMs. These ships had been built for operation in sheltered waters only, and their carrying capacity was small. The naval requirements represented a very big increase in load and demand that they should be used all over the world. This made it necessary that the steps should be taken to improve their strength and seaworthiness concurrently with the provision of the troop accommodations and the davits. Davits are critical. The ships were practically stripped down and rebuilt above the upper deck. Additional oil fuel and fresh water tanks were built and petrol for the landing craft auxiliary. Uh, landing craft assault, LCA. Uh, was carried in special cylindrical tanks with a delivery line to positions near the, the davits. Cast iron fittings in the main services were replaced in fabricated steel. Bulkhead valves were fitted to all main pipes. Non-return valves to the ends of the suction lines. Geared storm valves were fitted where scuppers act to pass through the ship's sides. The watertight doors in machinery space bulkheads and in the tunnels were removed and the openings blanked off. The LCM, which had been carried on deck and lifted by derricks in the glens, were davit lifted in these two ships. This necessitated the provision of gravity-type davits very much stronger than had ever been used before. The advantage of carrying such heavy boats in davits was that they could be launched more quickly and could in fact be used in an assault with the assault boats. But the davit hoisting of the craft did not solve the problem of how they were to be loaded with vehicles. And although the LCM davits were kept in these ships throughout their whole of their service career, such davits did not become standard, and other methods, which will be described later, had to be evolved for providing landing craft uh, mechanised LCMs in the assault areas. The next step in provision of LSI was the conversion of two Belgian cross-channel ships to LSI smalls. And the Belgian ships, well... They're even more intriguing. They're these ships. But today we are talking about these. Ships, it's described as rather than being a quick and easy conversion because Ferry had open spaces. No. The ships were practically stripped down and rebuilt above the upper deck. These words come from one of the constructors who was involved in the process. A naval architect, therefore, involved in the process. Say? Probably knows what they're talking about? You know, I, I guess the naval architect who's signing off on some of the drawings and overseeing the construction work probably knows what they're talking about. So if they're saying it's a complete rebuild above deck, that doesn't sound like a quick or easy job, but it is done fairly quickly. And part of the rebuild is fitting spaces like this. This is a standard 74-person ba mess accommodation barracks space, which is designed for ships. 
it has all the spaces they need for accommodating 74 soldiers. It has their rifle back racks. It has kit storage. It has various other storage facilities. And it has all the places they need to eat and basically survive. As well as some open space to allow them to do some exercise and basically support themselves. And fitting in spaces like this is the priority when you're building a vessel which is designed to get, take soldiers to war. Believe it or not, and this might come as a shock, especially those people who um, decided to cut whole decks off the design for Albion and Bulwarks so they didn't have such things as a hospital deck or a hangar or a, a large gym facility. If you want to keep troops in good condition when you're sending them off on long ranges to conduct operations when they jump ashore, it requires space. Space for them to exercise, space for them to communicate, space for them to plan, space for them to communicate, to go over issues. It requires space. And that is a problem in a ship, because in a ship, space is finite. You see, this is the other small issue with ships versus uh, when you're taking a whole load of soldiers there. Is that soldiers are used to being able to just expand their space when they need to. They are used to being able to change things around. And that works for them. It's good for them. It fits for them. But in the outside world, if you want more space in your soldiers, well, you have guns and you can usually just go, we need the space. Or you're in a big land base anyway, which tends to have quite a lot of space. On a ship, you could point the guns at whoever you like, and they're just going to go... Well, you can have plenty of space, but it'll get very wet. Tends to win the argument. So they were 4,135 gross registered tons, or 2,100 uh, NRT. The thing is, their weights sort of change. This is, those are the weights officially when they are... When, he says, when they're civilian ships. And when they're adapted, well, officially their weights don't change either. But, and I'd say this, that they're still supposed to be 4,135 tons, uh, gross registered tons. However, interestingly enough, if we go through the details here, and we go through the details you find for the ship, some things do change. The ferries themselves in their original configuration are supposed to be capable of 24 and a half knots. The Navy, the Royal Navy, had them listed as capable of 22 knots. Interesting enough, the Royal Navy claimed they had 13,000 shaft horsepower to 13,000 shaft horsepower diesel engines, um, each supplying, you know that. And the uh, previous ferry configuration said it was 12,500. On two shafts. I don't know why that says drafts. You can never tell these slides are written by a dyslexic, could you? As a ferry, they could carry 1,800 passengers. The reality of covering people for longer ranges and having to take all the equipment with them meant that, as an LCMR, LCIM, they carried 372 troops and 60 uh, landing craft personnel. Oh. And a crew as a ferry was 58 officers and crew. As a LCIM, it's 167 officers and crew. And here's some of the reason why the crew numbers go up. They carried two 12-pounder, 76mm guns, two 2-pounder, that's 40mm pom-poms, four 20mm Hotchiss guns, and two 303 cali cali uh, machine guns. Plus, um, you have all these extra crew as well, because whilst the... Landing craft personnel cover the people who actually drive the landing craft. They don't cover the necessary people who crew the davits and operate all the systems which deploy those landing craft. That's the naval crew. 
So when you have six landing craft assault, each with their own 10 ton davit, and two LCM, each with their own 30 ton davit, so you have eight davits to crew, that's again a whole load of people, because instead of, let's say, you need a crew of five per davit, that's 40. And probably need some people watching them, etc. You probably, you probably end up with about 48 to 50. Then you have the guns, and suddenly the 167 officers and crew, which can seem a massive increase. And once when I was using this as an example with... Who was it with? Can't remember. It was... I think... It was someone who was a deficiency expert or something like that. They, they worked in engineering. I think it was oil exploration engineering. And... They said it sounded like a massive increase, and who was in who, who was personal fiefdom was it? And the reality was, well, as a ferry, it's taking people backwards and forwards. As a warship, it's got to operate the davits, it's got to maintain the davits, it's got to operate the guns, it's got to maintain the guns, and it's got to do everything whilst also maintaining three continuous watches for longer range and longer journeys than a cross-channel ferry would pro normally do. Yes, the crew requirements are going to go up dramatically. If anyone's really surprised, then I worry about them. Fun times. But let's consider the actual design. Let's consider what in this book is labelled Figure 3. Yes, this is the design. Glory in it. Enjoy it. Think this is what a converted ferry looks like. So, next time you hear someone saying, "Yes, we can easily convert ferries to amphibious ship uh, amphibious ships," just think about how much this ferry has changed its accommodations to carry out the operations. Look at those big davits, which had to be fitted for starters. The realities of carrying LCMs and LCAs. The pom pom positions. The 12 pounder guns, the bridge, the structural changes. Think about all those mess spaces which have had to be stuck in. All those accommodation spaces which have been modified. All the cabins which have been altered around. Magazines added in. I can guarantee a regular ferry doesn't have magazines. And definitely not the ability to rapidly pass ammunition from those magazines to guns and other positions. So that they can fire. It's, it's a modified ship. It's a very much a modified ship. And this is another thing to think about, really, when we're talking about ship construction. And we're talking about the values of ships. Because this is a lot of work. It's still cheaper and quicker than building a whole new ship. Why? Because the engines are all done. Because all the stuff they say, all everything pretty much above the main deck is altered. Is completely stripped away and redone. Everything below the main deck, there are things added in. But those things are things around the engines, around the engineering spaces. The whole thing really about the ship, its major value, you can change all the other stuff around as long as the hull has hull life in it and the engines still work. And as long as the shafts are also sighted and are not running fine, but I suppose that comes under engines still work, you're good. You're good and you can adapt it. And that's what they do. They adapt it. Then we get to their service life, and ooh, does that get interesting. One of the first things that's interesting to pick up within their service lives is that Princess Beatrix and Queen Ember seem to get a different standard of officer in terms of their ranking. In that, Beatrix gets Acting Commander, Thomas Bennett Brodden, Acting Lieutenant Commander, John Fulcher Coleman, Temporary Acting Lieutenant Commander, Joseph Downs King. 
They're all RNR, mostly, other than Br Brunton, who was Royal, Royal Navy. Acting Commander Joseph Stretch, RD, and RNR. And Commander, retired, Benjamin Evans, RNR, DSC in RD, R and Royal Navy Reserve, is uh, her commanding officer from September 1945 till 1946. In contrast, Queen Emma gets Lieutenant Commander Edward John Robert North, Royal Navy Reserve. And what's interesting is that he's in command of her from December 1940 till mid-1941. Brunton commands Beatrix from November 1940 till 1944. The remaining commanders managed to come between 1944 and 1946 for Princess Beatrix. But for Emma, she has Lieutenant Commander Edward John Robert North from December 1940 to mid-1941. Captain Cecil Ashworth Kershaw, Royal Navy, retired from mid-1941 to September 1941. And then has Captain, retired again, George Louis Downall Gibbs, Royal Navy, um... From September 1941 till mid sort of early 1944, and then we're not quite sure who's in command of her, or frankly who's the ranking officer, until it gets to March 1945, when that's acting commander Thomas Louis Alkin. So, interesting officers in charge. Interesting officers in charge. What I find always interesting when I'm looking up certain ships and certain positions is the number of retired officers who end up being called back to be in charge. There is often this idea that the Royal Navy manufactures a senior officer force from nowhere in World War II. They don't. A lot of retired officers are called back to service. People who were fine to command ships but weren't able to be promoted up higher. Some people are <coughs> experienced and get called back. Um, I, there is an idea in my mind at some point to look at the origins of some of the convoy commodores, because I think at one point every single convoy at sea, which was commanded by a comma, has a convoy commodore who was actually a full admiral in their previous service and had enlisted for the war to serve as convoy commodores. And you sort of understand at that point why there is a small problem in the command structure for the convoys. Because theoretically, theoretically, the senior naval officer is the escort commander and they should have full control over naval matters. However, when your convoy commodore, who's in charge of the convoy and organising that with their staff and organising the merchant ships, is a former admiral or admiral of the fleet, um, how does a commander in charge of destroyer flotilla or sloop flotilla, etc., how do they go... You know what, sir? I'm going to ignore whatever you suggest and do what I think I should do. You can't. You know, theoretically you're supposed to, but in reality, that person trained the people who trained the people who trained the people who trained me, probably. Uh, they are intimately aware and probably agreed to the promotion of all the people above me. That's not someone you want to have an argument with. It's not someone... You, yes, you might if you think you know, really are sure of yourself. Uh, but the Royal Navy has a, a, a um, process for that. It's had one since... It's been the same process ever since they developed a sort of signals book in Kempton felt like. If a junior officer is telling a senior officer what they're planning of action and are not looking for consultation... They'll say, my intention is, in a signal. It's an unofficial code. My intentions are. 
And that's basically code for this is what I think is best to a course of action. Only, please only correct this if you're absolutely certain what I'm doing is going to be wrong. Because it's sort of taking on his, their own head. And Abels understand this. But that's also why when you look at some of the convoy signals, the word intentions comes up quite often from convoy escort to convoy commodore. When you're thinking, well, hang on, you're, this person's a retired officer who's been put in charge of the convoy. This is a, you know, surely there should be some sort of more of an equal, equality of approach here going on. Nope. And again, when we consider some of these officers, some of these officers, and honestly, I'm going to take Essential Ashroth Kershaw as the good ex as the example. In World War Two, he commands Queen Emma, Alush Alunia, and Bolobo, a landing ship infantry medium, and two armed merchant cruisers. He'd entered the service, well, he entered Osborne, the Royal Navy College, in January 1908. He'd risen up through the ranks. He'd retired, gone away, and is called back. You know, his service group had included people like John Creswell, like John... Uh, is it John Creswell? It is John Creswell, yes. And John Pocketing Money. Sorry, I was remembering there's a Jack Creswell, who is another naval officer... At that time, there's uh, Alex Creswell, and there's uh, Anthony Creswell, and there's a uh, Michael Creswell, and John Creswell. There are a lot of Creswells going around. They're not related as far as I know, but there are a lot of Creswells going around who do different things. There are a lot of officers going around who have interesting names and interesting connections. And... The thing about these officers are the Royal Navy can't utilize them all in peacetime. They really can't. You can't, not everyone can become an admiral. In fact, the Royal Navy's not going to have everyone become an admiral. There's no point. So the more captains you have, the more officers you have coming in, the lower ranks you have going, the more selective you can be about who gets to the top. But that also means the more you have options in a major war to go and look at go, well... This is the batch who went through to the next level. This is the batch who were just below them, who we didn't want to keep around. How good are they? And so, you have two avenues of promotion. You can go for rapid promotion of junior officers, which is, to be honest, what the Royal Navy does with motor torpedo boats, submarines, and destroyers. Small vessels. With cruisers, they try and keep two officers who they know broadly speaking, have got the experience and are on track. Sloops are an interesting group. Corvettes and sloops tend to benefit from getting a large number of reservists. As do trawlers. But auxiliary ships, converted merchant ships, all those things, that's a large number of retired officers called up and gone. You know how to run a ship. You know how to hold a ship together. Because if you think about it, it's about balancing where does experience serve you best, where does energy serve you best. Where does being the rock-solid nature of experience serve you best? And if you think about that with destroyers, with all the smaller vessels, you need aggression, you need energy, you will learn experience quickly. But if you're running a ship which is going to be housed to soldiers doing missions which you haven't worked out yet and which could call for all sorts of things to be drawn from the crew, you're going to have plenty of people aboard the ship who are going to have the energy and the vitality you need. But you're going to want to temper that with some heavy experience. You want the going to want experience. And this is where these officers come in. And these ships are useful because they're actually good command training facilities, good facilities to learn and get experience in. They are the right size. They deploy enough troops, they have enough space for people to talk it out, for people to discuss things. And the reports that go back from the officers on Beatrix, on Emma, are what help shape a lot of policies when it comes to amphibious operations. Now, 
I've got a special slide to talk about Operation Claymore, which is their first major operation. But they do other things. They do convoys to Gibraltar. They do operations off the coast of Algiers and Iran, Iran during Operation Torch. These ships take part in so many different operations in World War II. And the more you look into them, the more you realise, hang on, these were really valuable assets for the Royal Navy. Now, they operated as part of the Central Task Force in November 1942 of Operation Torch. And while Central Task Force, you know, typically we tend to talk about it being made up of Rodney, of Furious of Bitter, of Dasher, of Jamaica, Aurora, Delhi, Almanc, Boreas, Brilliant, Bodeisha, Bodicea, um, Bulldog, Beagle, Amazon, Akites, Antelope, Wyvern, Westcott, Verity, Va uh, Vanisat, uh, Ironvale, Farndale, Puckridge, I can't remember what that C1 is, Kelp, Ursula, uh, P-54, another submarine, by Super Ryan Isle. Felix, HMS Felix Stone, always good to have her around. And all sorts of other little ships wandering around and motor launches. The point of the task force was that you had amphibious ships, which was a headquarters ship, HMS Largs, or board which was uh, Commodore Trowbridge of the Royal Navy, Glengale, Beatrix, Emma, Royal Scotsman, Royal Ulsterman, Ulster Monarch, uh, Derwentdale, which had been converted to land a whole lot of interesting things. That was part, of, of course, the Dale class tankers, which the Royal Navy had built prior to the war to provide them with the fast tankers, and then they get converted to amphibious ships. I'll do a whole video about them at some point. But basically, that's also the question of when people go. The Royal Navy didn't prepare tankers prior to World War II. Actually, they did. It's just some bright spark decided that they'd convert them to amphibious ships once the war started. And then when it came to Pacific War, they needed to build whole new ones because they'd either been lost or were so useful as amphibious ships, they didn't want to lose them in that role. <sighs> Life is annoying sometimes. Best laid plans of mice and men often go as I. And, um... Bakaro, of course, which I've talked about on this channel before, uh, Misoa, and Tasajira. These ships are critical for this force. This is the landing force. This is the force that is going to take Iran. And it's so easy sometimes to forget about the fact that the merchant fleets were talking about, the, the ships were talking about, in terms of the amphibious forces, are pulled from the merchant fleets, especially during the early operations. They are conversions. And we think about losses in terms of convoys, in terms of Battle Atlantic, as an effect on supplies. But it's also affecting your pool of merchant vessels, which you are pulling in so many different directions. No, you couldn't use Emma and Beatrix for cross-Atlantic transit. After their adaptions, perhaps you could, but let's be honest, you wouldn't want to take them across the Central Atlantic. Taking them from the Bay of Biscay was going to be fun. The Central Atlantic would be friggin' interesting. But, these vessels were detailed off to Operation Corkscrew, which was, of course, the captures of Pantelleria and La Medusa. They were detailed to become parts of Operations Jurist and Beecham, which were going to be the landings at um, Sabang and Penang. I do love the way it was going to be a, a landing at both of those, which was, of course, was going to help end some part of the war in Southeast Asia. Uh, these vessels were in use the whole way through World War II. From the moment they were converted to the moment the war ended, they were in use they were useful. They were of value. They were of service. And of course, well, Operation Claymore is still probably the most famous, most important thing they do, arguably, because it's this operation which proves not only the value of amphibious ships, 
the value of the landing craft they're carrying, but also proves the value of the commando operations and commando forces. Operation Claymore is absolutely critical. And it does get me into fun sometimes, because... And before I get into account, I rarely bother to discuss, in Operation Claymore terms, the covering force. Why? Because the covering force doesn't go anywhere near where they're operating. They're there as cover in case a German battleship comes out to attack them. They have Nelson, they have King George V, they have Edinburgh, they have Nigeria, they have Ingerfield, Ingerfield, Maori, Punjabi, Echo, and Eclipse with them. Edinburgh and Nigeria provide a measure of close escort for the covering for, for the landing force, but even they withdraw before the operation actually takes place. And Sunfish, is, if you want to argue for any support, is probably the closest support, because she acted as a beacon to guide the ships in, of the landing force in. But the landing force, the actual force that goes in, the actual does the fighting, does the engagement, does the landing of the troops, supports them with their gunfire, are Beatrix and Emma as the transports, Somalia, Bedouin, Eskimo, Tata, four tribal class destroyers, and HMS Legion. And frankly, that's the way it was always going to be in this operation. That's the way it was always going to be. Because what are you going to risk for this operation? Are you really going to risk Nelson getting too close? And let's be honest, with Nelson and King George V there, anything comes out of play, it's not going to survive him too much. But this is, again, this is prior, it's March 1941, it's prior to the sinking of Bismarck, it's prior to a lot of things taking place. And I have... A nice write of it in my book. In fact, it's pages in this, which is the paperback edition. Uh, pages 52. 50, no, 53 to 56. Gotta remember, even number of pages on this side. The events of March 1941 around the Lofoten ra raid were, in terms of strength, of strategic importance, if not in terms of fighting, not dissimilar to those around the more familiar Battle of Cape, off Cape Matapan. Taking place on the 4th of March 1941, prior to Matapan, it came first chronologically, but its impact is better understood in the context of Matapan. Claymore, like so many military operations conducted in the 20th century, was about oil. Not in this case crude oil, but fish oil. Fish oil was a key lubricant for many of the munitions and lubricants upon which the Nazi war machine depended. Lafon was a critical point in the chain of production for those supplies. An Allied attack was, however, a long-range gamble. The force would have no air cover. No land aircraft would be within range, and no aircraft carriers were available. Furthermore, it would be supported by no ships larger than a destroyer. The force was going to have to be entirely self-reliant and operate in the face of significant potential enemy retaliation. Principally because the covering force was being kept back because to bring it in closer was considered to court death at the time. As pointed out, that covering force doesn't have its own aircraft carrier with it. And the British understand that you need the aircraft carrier to break up the outer enemy aircraft coming in. You don't want to take your aircraft into the, your ships into the threat of air cover uh, of air, enemy air cover without having something that can break up the air attacks. Because, and I know I have to explain this almost every single video I touch this on because I get people who haven't ever watched any of the videos before. The doctrine for especially 1930s 1940s naval uh, naval air defence was you use fighters to break up the enemy attacks into groups of flights or less. You use heavy A to break up the flights into single or two, single aircraft, roughly maybe two, but single aircraft. Then you use medium A and light A to engage the aircraft, uh, the individual aircraft, as they come in one at a time to attack your ships, so they can't they don't they get put off and they don't hit your ship. If you kill them, great. As long as they don't hit the ship, that's the requirement. 
So the whole thing is about breaking it up into manageable chunks, breaking all the attacking force up into manageable chunks. And that's what you have a carrier for. If you don't have a carrier available, it's far more difficult to do that. So that is why their covering force is holding quite as far back as it is. Which means it might as well not have been there. Four tribals are to provide 80% of the total fighting force. Carrying by this time a quick-firing 4-inch anti-aircraft gun in place of an, of an X mounting, they were judged capable of putting up a good defense against anything, and of being a, ser a serious threat offensively. Along with the, con uh, the uh, converted Dutch passenger ferries acting as infantry landing ships, Queen Emma and Princess Beatrix, officially designated landing ship infantry medium, uh, they were also supplemented by Legion, an L-class destroyer which had 4-inch guns fitted in all mountings, making her in theory at least an anti-aircraft destroyer. The 4-inch gun was an interesting weapon. While it was primarily intended for air use, just as the 4.7-inch gun with the, which the tribals were fit armed was primarily orientated for anti-ship use, it was still an effective general-purpose weapon, especially when used against lighter, faster craft such as e-boats. Schnell boats. Just as the 4.7-inch was a reasonably potent anti-aircraft weapon, as long as the aircraft were not attacking from too close to vertical. This combination of weapons and ships supported by a considerable amount of unconventional thinking, was a review of uh, importance to operational success. Operation Claymore had the potential to cause trouble, particularly beyond the area which the force, where the force was dependent on Allied assistance and cooperation. The force were refueled from the tanker RFA War Prendare at Scalfador, in the British-occupied Danish Faroe Islands. More significantly, it would, be, uh, it would be an attack on a key Norwegian industry, if improperly handled, it had the potential to cause not only reprisals, economic or worse, on Norwegian civilians by Nazi authorities, but also deaths at British hands which the attendant, with the attendant political consequences. For this reason, the rules of engagement were tight. In fact, compared with the sum of those used in later operations, they could almost be described as, a mod as modern, with their focus on avoiding civilian casualties and damage to civilian infrastructure. The restrictions were partly due to the novelty of the operation, for it was the first such operation to be undertaken, and it was to be conducted against a relatively densely populated area for such a target. It was incredibly important to not upset the Norwegian government in exile, nor give the ammunition to the Nazi propaganda machine. Operation Claymore was to be the first major commander raid of the Second World War, and would set the pattern for many operations to come. It was a departure from the previous small amphibious operations, uh, Valentine and Fork, respectively, the British occupation of the Faroe Islands and the invasion of Iceland, early in the war. It made use of specialist shipping and specialist troops alongside the very special generalists, the tribal class. Not only was all this assorted equipment to be used, but to complicate matters, the landing would not be concentrated. In enough a parallel with modern operational concepts, they were to be distinctly dispersed. Some troops were going to Stamersund on the island of Vestavui, some to the islands of Henningsberg, while others were dispatched to Svolva on Osterga, and still more to Bretzens on Somalia. This was by definition a widely distributed operation, and sorry for mangling all the names of all the Norwegian places. Something which in the, the pre-helicopter assisted era of amphibious warfare was a much bigger risk than it would be today. There was no quick way to concentrate ground forces should unexpected resistance be met, and if such circumstances did arise, the ground forces' dependence on the support of warships was absolute. This is the reason the tribals were chosen, because the sheer amount of firepower they could bring to bear. Uh, the idea was very quickly, um, if ground forces run into trouble, pummel them. Uh, no, you, you wait for fire, can, uh, fire to be called in. Pummel them. Wait for us to call. Pummel them. Okay, just pummel them, but be discreet about it. Okay. Don't aim to hit civilians. Won't aim to hit civilians. At one point, one of the tribals does use about does fire about three salvos to deal with a single mortar. They deal with the mortar. The four inch joined in as well as the four point sevens. It it all adds to the overall effect. Fortunately, this was not to put to the test, but the possibility does make the diversion of warships very logical. It was Legion that escorted the commandos to Stomsund. 
the attack tar attack target taking uh, the attack taking place furthest from the mainland, and therefore least likely to suffer any surprises. In contrast, the commandos for Hemsvær, Stova, and Bratsend were escorted by Eskimo, Tata, and Bedouin, respectively. With Somali going from port to port, providing support while at the same time acting as both naval and military command post. Having embarked the commander, Brigadier Hayden, and Rear Admiral Louis Keppel Hamilton aboard. When considering the Namsos experience, where air attacks and fast German counterattack have been a critical factor to operations, this is understandable, although it must have put a strain on the commanding officer at the time, Captain Clifford Carrison. It did not adversely affect his subsequent career, which included command as captain of the battleship Nelson and promotion to Vice Admiral and the running of Singapore for the Navy. Again, Royal Navy Tribal Class officers, they do go on to interesting ranks. Uh, the commandos were able to achieve multiple landings because of the unique davit launch system of the LSIMs, uh, landing craft mechanized, which enabled them to be launched in the same wave as the uh, landing craft of assault. I told you that when we were talking about the design that that would come in handy at some point. Sand and infantry carry employed by the Navy throughout the war. This mattered because LCMs could ac accommodate quadruple the tonnage of an LCA enabling commandos to take essential equipment on. It was diesel ships, far more than their transports, which needed the escort, and previous experience in Norway had already demonstrated their vulnerability. It was while acting as a ranging shield that Somali, the tribal not assigned for close escort, took part in the only naval firefight of the operation when she encountered Krebs, an armed trawler, which yielded a set of rotors for an Enigma machine and some code books, which were of great use to Bletchley Park. And it's not one of the ones you ever hear about. You don't really hear about Somalia and the Krebs. You you hear about all the other submarines and the various things. But, yeah. This one happened as well. How the gem vessel only managed three shots before being permanently silenced after she ran aground on fire and out of control. The five surviving crew were picked up by Somali. It was a very one-sided exchange. Benduin intercepted the unarmed coastal ferry Mira which had the misfortune of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Unexpectedly, however, this vessel continued on her course despite being ordered to stop. Because an officer in charge of the German equivalent of an Entertainment's National Service Association group had put a gun to the captain's head and wanted to go down fighting. Bedouin, in case the ferry passed word to other job and occupation forces, had to sink her and then rescue the survivors, including the gun-wielding officer and the captain. The captain requested nasty things be done to the gun-wielding officer. The Royal Navy said... Sorry, he's a prisoner. But if you want, we'll sit him next to you. At the same time, Tata continued the tradition of efficiency established during Narvik, focusing on the valuable merchant ships with her 4.7-inch main guns and diligently sinking them. Mostly, these were of the coastal variety, but they also included vessels such as the 9,780-ton Hamburg, a refrigerated fish factory ship in great demand due to the Battle of the Atlantic, and which the Naval Demolition Party had fancied as their prize transport home to the UK, but they had apparently forgotten to tell anyone else of their plan. Hence Tata went, big target, blow up. Rather unusually for her, Eskimo had little to do, and this expected level of opposition did not materialise. This was particularly true of the air threat, feared throughout the planning, but which only materialised at the end when a lone reconnaissance aircraft appeared. However, it never reached within range of the Gulf Force guns, nor could it manage to send any report as Bedouin jammed its signal. No further aircraft appeared, and the force made it home successfully to Scarpa at 1300 hours on the 6th of March. The force had sunk a 10 ships for a total of 19,350 tonnes of shipping, destroyed 18 factories, including 8 critical emollient producer uh, to emollient production. Furthermore, 800,000 gallons of oil in seven tank farms was burned. The force had rounded all this all up off by taking 213 Germans and 12 Quislings prisoner, as well as 300 Norwegian volunteers. For combined operations command, it was testimony to a job well done. And it was all practical thanks to the high speed of Beatrix and Emma, in contrast to other landing ships available at the time, but also the fact that all these ships were capable of independent operation. This was a useful system. You notice I didn't include the Naval Party in this. That's because the Naval Party is an interesting organization for going ashore at this time, the Naval Demolitions Party, and there is a lot of discussion exactly of 
who was in that group and how many there were. Because there's an official list, that one you often have referred to, and then there's potentially some people from... I'm not sure if it's still... It's referred to at this time as the Boom Patrol Detachment there. Royal Marines Boom Patrol Detachment. There's various other little organizations which may or may not have sent people who were also added in a part of it. Partially to gain experience, but partially also to assist with it. So, it's, it's an interesting scenario when you start to look at the personnel and go, there might have been a few more people in that naval party, which might also explain why it wasn't clear to the rest of the Navy involved in this operation that they wanted that particular ship. They wanted to take the refrigeration ship home. It would have been nice to have the refrigerated ship. Uh, that refrigerated factory ship would have been a very useful asset to have home in the UK. But no one had told the destroyers this. They all presumed someone else had. And for me, that usually springs from a scenario where the naval party has had people added onto it. And everyone thought someone else's job was to do that. <sighs> Summary. They are cool ships. They really are. They're useful ships. You might have noticed as of late with key ships that I've started... I've now established the series. I'm working out how to approach submarines for it. I'm working out how to approach other ships. I'm doing the key aircraft series. And then the key ship series, I've started working down to ships which are less well known. And I'm hoping... I'm hoping that because... Some of the previous members of parts of the series have been the very popular ships, have been Warspite, Texas, those things, that it will allow these ships to be more well known. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping, that more will be done about these ships. One of the things I would love to someday do is have the money and time to be able to devote myself full-time to making videos and writing books. To just do that. Produce the history. And giving lectures and talks and ships and those sort of things. But just do that. I'm not in that space yet. I don't have the income. I don't have those things. I'm, I'm closer to it than I ever have been, thanks to all of your support. But I don't have that yet. And so part of what I use the videos for, I have to admit especially when I'm putting out videos like this, is I would love to see others go off and do that. I have been wanting to do an amphibious ships book, like I did the tribal class books, tribal battle and daring's, to do an amphibious ships book for years. Will I get the chance? I don't know. I've got a good few years writing yet left yet. Good few years. And I want to produce a fair number of books. But there is only so many hours in a day. And, you know, it's nice to occasionally have a social life as well. History pretty much is my social life, but, you know, it's nice to have something else. So, yeah, I'm doing videos about them. And I always end the videos with a question, and this is going to be no different. But this question is going to be a bit different, because if we go back to the stats and to this lovely lovely bit of ex bit of experience you know the royal navy drawing on experience to the army what's worked out of what it needs in terms of mess accommodation what is the how they should try and form the messes the question i want to ask you is this whilst the royal navy and the army spent a lot of year a lot of the time in 1920s and 30s developing amphibious warfare capabilities I have occasionally with LSLs, I was doing the previous LSLs, asked the question of what happens if they built some more prior to World War II? If they built some auxiliaries prior to World War II? If they'd gone through the treaty limitations, and there are some limitations, but they could probably get around some of them, but in terms of auxiliaries, they can probably work it out for, uh, and produce some decent amphibious auxiliaries. 
and produce them? Would it have been a benefit? Now, my view very much is that it would have been. It would A, given them a ready-made amphibious force. They'd have probably lost a few of them in things like Dunkirk and other evacuations. But there again, they might have also sped up Nor things like Norway. Uh, there is an interesting discussion where various people in the chat, um, not in the chat, but in the comments of videos, tend to assert that Britain was also planning to invade Norway and if the Germans had waited, they'd have, Britain would have got there first and then Britain would be the bad guys. There are some interesting points about that. I would say the British were more thinking about do they need to invade to protect things because they're worrying the Norwegians weren't taking the threat seriously and they thought the Germans were likely to invade. Because they knew how important Norway was in World War I. And the thing was, in World War I, the Norwegians had been more prepared than they were in World War II. The Norwegian government in World War I are just as firmly neutral, but are a lot more prepared for war in World War I than they are in World War II, which you think is kind of weird in some regards. I don't think the British necessarily invade. I think they maybe take the pharaohs. I think what they do is they posture, and they wait for a German invasion, and then they go in. As it was, the Germans got there first. That saved the British problem. Of working out whether they wanted to invade, they were prepared to invade a neutral country, or whether they wanted to just wait until the Germans went in. But the thing is, if you have special shipping already built, and already ready and ready to go, you'll have troops already formed up ready rearing to go. It means you probably ha you might have it might be dedicated army brigades, it might be dedicated or it might be the Royal Marines that form the brigade. It might be a combined force. There was an interesting experiment in the nineteen thirties, I think, where they tried an Indian brigade army brigade, but it had Royal Marines attached in at the battalion level. And that was used for some of the amphibious exercises. And it would be interesting to see what route the British would have gone down. And so that's it's a sort of a two stage question I want to give I want to give you. One, do you think the British should have had actually used this all these ideas they had going around and actually built some amphibious ships? Some support ships to support amphibious operations prior to World War Two? And secondly, if they did, what do you think kind of organization they would have formed they would have formed for Conducting amphibious warfare because if you have actually proper ships, you probably can create a proper a proper amphibious force. Do you think the army, with their expeditionary orientation, would have refused to see their expeditionary force broken up to have that? So it would end up having to be the Royal Navy forming up the Royal Marines. Would it therefore be attached to the mobile naval basing formations? And would the Royal Navy be thinking them more as a expeditionary as sort of expeditionary elements for the naval basing forces? In which case, does that have an effect on Crete? I'd love to hear your opinions on this because it's something I want to go into. It's something I want to go into as time goes on. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you as ever for all your support. This will go out on Saturday, the 30th of December, and. Well, Sunday, I will be doing in UK time. I might even do a Twitch stream in the morning, or at least midday to early afternoon. But um, in the afternoon, I will be live from 7 to 11 on New Year's Eve, taking naval history questions and chatting with you all. I look forward to it. I will have some 1901 Iron Brew hopefully delivered on Saturday. And thank you very much for watching. Take care. I hope you enjoyed. And let's leave you with a cooler picture on this one. Oh, that is a cool picture. But I think we're going to go for that one. Thank you very much, everyone.